Okay, welcome everyone to Module 4, Unit 2. This unit will be focused on getting your data organized for analysis. So we have three learning objectives. Uh, I hope by the end of this brief module, you'll be able to explain different data types. Qualitative data comes in all different kinds of forms. We typically think of data as textual, of words but it can be in a lot of different forms um, and different approaches to the analysis. So why might you take a different approach to the analysis? You might need to organize your data differently depending on the approach. Uh, we also hope you can describe how to prepare the data for analysis. And part of this is being able to distinguish between transforming your data, cleaning your data and classifying your data. So I just want to remind you of how we think about the steps to the analysis. Unlike quantitative data, there is more iterative back and forth. We think of this as more of a secular uh, uh, process. Um, but in order to be in the analysis, we want to pay attention to how the data needs to be organized and prepared for the analysis. So when we think about different data types, like I said, mostly people think about words uh, in a Word document that are analyzed, but data can be textual, can be audio, can be visual. Uh, a friend of mine just did an arts-based performance, um, it, which you could envision looking across a lot of different performance arts as data and looking for patterns across them. So qualitative inquiry, qualitative data are, are very, uh, diverse. There's lots of different kinds. And so you can imagine you want to get the data all looking similarly such that you can look across all the data points for either patterns in the data or analyze them depending on your analytic approach. Um, these are just two examples. We might look at um, messages, images in, uh, in um, graffiti art in the neighborhood level. We might look at the textual data from the graffiti art and, and look at um, messages within the text. Um, we talked about in these modules uh, photo voice as a methodology. Um, photos are data and you would want to prepare the photos for analysis in the same way that you would text. So just want to remind you when we think about qualitative data analysis, we are moving from data to assumptions or theory. That are, um, how are we interpreting the findings? What are our takeaways? And so in order for us to walk through these steps, in order for us to code, look for subcodes, look for categories, identify themes and concepts in the data, we want to make sure the data is organized well. So real briefly, we went over these approaches in previous modules, um, but a lot of people assume that qualitative data analysis really has one main approach, which is thematic analysis or directed content analysis. Some people use these terms interchangeably, um, but there's a lot of different ways in which you can do the analysis. And we want to remember these different approaches because we might want to organize our data somewhat differently uh, towards these approaches. So just real briefly, when we think about directed content analysis. This is analysis that is um, directed with attention to the content itself. So it typically be begins with an a priori conceptual framework for structuring the analysis. So instead of grounded theory, which is really exploratory, there's an element of deduction in this. Uh, and it's typically used to explore textual data for insights relative to a research question with a goal of extending knowledge in this area. And it has particular utility in research areas where current theory or previous evidence really needs some further elucidation. Uh, directed content analysis there then is different from grounded theory. We talked about this in previous models, but this is an approach to research. It's an approach to data collection. It's an approach to analysis that is really good for developing theory from data. Uh, and it involves trying to eliminate a priori assumptions. Um, uh, and so it is a very inductive. So you might want to organize your data differently uh, if you're using a grounded theory. And lastly, uh, increasingly people are becoming interested in a phenomenological lens or a phenomenological approach to their uh, research. Uh, this really privileges, emphasizes the lived experience of the phenomena and it's investigating what is experienced and how it is experienced. You, you would code differently with a phenomenological lens and therefore you might want to organize your data somewhat differently. So it's important to know 
your analytic approach. The most common one is what people call a, a thematic analysis, um, which is really trying to identify themes. And that visual of moving from data to themes to interpretation uh, it is, speaks really to a phenomenological lens. So there's really just three main topics I want to talk about in organizing data. I want to talk about transforming the data so you have it all in one <clears throat> format. I want to talk about cleaning the data and then classifying the data for coding, particularly using qualitative data analysis software, or what we call Cactus, to do your analysis. So when we think about transforming data, we're tend to talk about um, moving the data from one format to another. So what's most often is moving from an audio format of data to textual format. So an example is <clears throat> you conduct an interview or you conduct a fo photo focus group, you record that data collection opportunity, and then you need to transform that data from that MP4 file to a Word document. That Word document is then imported, uploaded to a qualitative data analysis software, so something like Atlas or Deduce or Max QDA, um, to do the analysis. So this is the most common is moving from audio to textual. Um, there is a movement in qualitative uh, uh, research among qualitative researchers to actually avoid this transformation and any kind of transformation some things are lost um, so I'm going to show you some examples of when we have actually kept the data in audio uh, made sure everything was in audio and that was important to us because um, hearing those voices uh, allowed a different um, uh, uh, insight into the voices rather than the textual where you lose the emphasis, you lose the emotion. Another example is just moving from field notes. A lot of people don't use the audio recordings, either don't have the equipment or participants aren't comfortable being recorded. Um, and so then, then researchers might have pages and pages of written field notes, written notes from the data collection event. Um, those can be analyzed in their original form. <clears throat> so excuse me, they would be graphic files like a JPEG or maybe a PDF. And you can analyze these both in ha by hand and also using Cactus. Um, but it might make sense to move that to textual data, so actually transcribing the handwritten notes so that you have a Word document. In terms of transcribing and all the research projects I work on, we come up with uh, transcription rules. Uh, we, it often takes us a while to figure out what is it that we want here. Uh, it can really depend on the data, uh, how you, what rules you want to make in transcribing. Um, but we use uh, a uh, audio player to slow down the speed, of course, of the audio file. We use Audacity, um, and then we will would. Um, go through and transcribe uh, by hand. And when we can't understand what's being heard, we put in inaudible or uninterpretable. And those are really placeholders for then the cleaning uh, stage of preparing your data. Um, in all of my research, um, we are looking for verbatim transcribing because the ways in which something is said is really important. This isn't always the case in research. In some cases, um, people do paraphrase. Uh, but our general rule is no bullets or paraphrase, and we're trying to use the real words um, of participants. And uh, the real words um, that people use involve a lot of non-word uh, words like ah, uh, um, aha, uh -huh, I hear it in my voice just as I'm recording this lecture, and we keep those in there. Sometimes those um, kind of non-words can say a lot. Um, we also try to keep in the, the pauses, um, the spaces of silence, and, and mark those because those can also say a lot. There is a lot of um, head nodding in uh, focus groups in particular, so you're giving some nonverbal cues. Uh, those are important to us in the transcription process to include because that is communicating something to the group, and so we include that as well. There are some, of course, important pros and cons to using a transcription service. Um, I almost always use a transcription service, um, but uh, it requires us to do a lot of cleaning because if you don't know the phenomena under inter, uh, um, under investigation, you can really uh, have a hard time with some vocabulary and the ways in which people talk about things. Um, 
Someday there will be technology that really easily moves us from audio to textual. Right now there are things like Dragon Naturally Speaking, and there's some functionality within YouTube, um, but so far it still involves a lot of cleaning. So speaking of cleaning, cleaning is really once you get that data in the format that you're interested, so let's say textual data, um, it's really important to clean the data. So um, the way we do this is we read or preferably listen to the data. <clears throat> so you're listening, for example, to the audio file and you're reading the verbatim uh, textual transcript and you're correcting things that weren't interpreted correctly. That's going to happen um, a lot, especially with the outside transcriptionist. And you're also importantly removing identifiers. Now, what's important is to follow your IRB protocol for what is an identifier. A voice is a very important identifier. Um, and so when we did our analysis of audio files, we actually had to change the speed of the, each audio file to remove the um, uniqueness of voices because voice was such an identifier. Um, what we also had to do is cut out of the audio file any identifiers for people who were referenced that weren't fo consented focus group participants, for example. So someone, if it's a public figure, it's fine if someone mentions Barack Obama, it can stay in there, but if someone mentions their neighbor next door who has this issue, this person isn't a participant in our research, they haven't consented for their name to be used in this way, we would cut that out of the audio file, we would cut it out of the Word document. So who should clean the data? The people closest to the data collection itself and closest to the phenomena. So this is the interviewers or the moderators, if it's an interview or a focus group. Um, and our, I do participatory research, so our research partners, our community partners, uh, would clean the data as well. And often this provides context characterization to something that might be misunderstood um, by that data collector. In our Participatory research, our interviewers and moderators are also research partners, so that um, helps. Um, so here's just some examples of other ways in which you might prepare the data to be analyzed or you want to clean the data. These are examples of um, song lyrics um, for songs written by women about work. Um, so this was a student um, assignment for a class, um, but we were interested in some of the themes, the messages in songs about work. Um, so these data were transcribed from a song itself, um, but because songs are uh, literary pieces, uh, we actually organized these uh, data so that they were more in a poetic form rather than in this more fluid form of how the person transcribed the data. So this is important because these data are conveyed in a particular way and you want to be able to read them in a particular way which involves um, moving from one line of the sentence to the next at an appropriate time which is consistent with what we perceive the author wanted to convey in these. So that's just an example. Uh, again, poetry, song lyrics are another kind of quality of data that can be used to examine a range of things. So the last thing I want to talk about is just classifying data. Um, the, these, this is really important because it begins your analytic process. You're basically trying to identify, so what do we have here? Um, what kinds of data is it? By what characteristics um, do we want to look at these data? Uh, and this is typically done in Cactus. Um, this is done in Cactus for sure because you're trying to organize your data in ways in which you can best analyze. Um, but it's used by different names. So in deduce, um, th this cactus refers to descriptors. Uh, that's the mechanism. I'm going to show you some examples. In Atlas TI, it's the use of families. Um, again, qualitative data analysis, computer-assisted qualitative data analysis software like Atlas TI, like Deduce, which I'm going to show you in a second, like MaxQDA, uh, is really helpful. Um, some qualitative data analysis happens outside of a computer, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you'd have to come up with a classifying system that made sense. And one of the challenges is when you have so much data, uh, having a computer assist is really helpful. So here's just an example of within Deduce of um, descriptors. So if you look on the bottom right hand side of this screen, um, this is how we decided to characterize the data. So these are our descriptors. So we are attaching descriptors to each data point. 
in this media window here, you'll see that this data type is an audio file. Like I said, we decided to keep all of our data in that original audio form because too much was being lost when we transcribed it. We had to put in too much additional context of, you know, focus group participants were upset about this or this focus group participant really emphasized this point. And so it was better for us to do this analysis in audio um, format. Um, so here's our, our media, our data points. Here's the codes, just so you remember about codes. And then here are descriptors. So we wanted to characterize the descriptors by um, what type of participants participated and some other descriptors, descriptors which are on the next slide. So here are some examples. Um, this is participant type. Were they, um, were they young people? Were they community health workers? Uh, were they um, day laborers? Were they street vendors? These were the type. Um, we use a purposive um, sampling uh, model here. Um, in which language did the focus group happen? So you can see we did our focus groups. Half of them occurred in Spanish, half in English, half were in North Lawndale, half were in Little Village. So this is the descriptor of the community area. Um, and then descriptors about uh, who actually did the focus group. So these are our community partners who did the focus group itself. So you can see there's all different ways in which you can characterize this data. This is um, how long the data were, uh, how long the focus group um, lasted. Um, so it really depends again on your research question and your, on your approach to the analysis. Another example, this is an example from a bladder study we did with sexual gender minority participants, so people who identify as a sexual gender minority. Um, for this study, we use textual data, so we move the data from audio form to uh, to textual words in a Word document. But what was important for this study is we also were interested in the handwritten field notes. So we were observing uh, the focus group itself and we were characterizing um, additional observation data along with the focus group data. So here we have two types of data right here. Also here are the codes. We used a directive content analysis approach. So our codes are linked to a conceptual model. This is a group three that links us back to the conceptual model. And for this study, there really were just a few descriptors that were of interest. So um, how the participants identified, um, the focus groups were organized by, um, by sexual gender identification. So we had uh, two focus groups with people who identify as trans male, uh, bisexual, gender nonconforming, lesbian, and queer, um, and then by age, uh, because the experiences of the bladder really vary much by age. Um, age is, has a huge influence on your bladder. We also characterized them by age. We also uh, had organized the focus group by age because of that, because social context by age is so important. So that's the end of this quick module on organizing your data. So from here, please go to the quiz, which hopefully will provide some additional context on uh, to contextualize this topic and allow for some additional learning. Thank you very much.